It's the night of September 11, 2012, and while the Benghazi attacks are underway, top officials at Clinton State Department already know the al-Qaeda-linked Islamic extremist group Ansar al-Sharia has taken credit. Within minutes, that alert goes to the White House, FBI, and Pentagon. But four hours later, Clinton's public statement evokes the idea the attackers were instead spontaneous protesters responding to inflammatory material posted on the Internet, an anti-Muslim YouTube video. Oh, I understand, Father. Certainly a lot Last year, Clinton was vague on whether she and President Obama discussed blaming the video instead of terrorists that night. I, I don't know that uh, I talked uh, about it with him at that conversation. Yeah, well, that leaves it wide open. Joining us now is the uh, voice you heard there, and, of course, it came from her show Full Measure with Cheryl Atkinson. Cheryl joins us. She's also the author of Stonewall, My Fight for Truth Against the Forces of Obstruction, Intimidation, and Harassment in Obama's Washington. Hey, Cheryl, how are you? Good, Steve. How are you? I'm good. All right, so Thursday's the big day, um, and, and I assume Hillary is going to be under oath, and I, it's going to be for all to see. What are you expecting? Are you expecting that question uh, that Brett Baer asked to be re-asked so that she has to, you know, she's pressed on it? Or are you expecting the Democrats to just, you know, stonewall, uh, to borrow a, a phrase uh, as much as they can and leave it up to the Republicans, of course? Well, if it were up to me, of course, that question would be asked and pressed, and I think there's a good chance it will be. Uh, the format, my understanding is, like a typical hearing, is it will go back and forth, so just about the time you feel like one side has got a line of questioning in and maybe getting to a point, it will be the other side's turn to distract and detract from anything that was right. just said before. And that sometimes can be a little frustrating. But I also tend to go in with low expectations of something that everybody else may be expecting something big from. Um, you know, I think we already know in the three years since Benghazi happened so much about the uh, improper or incorrect information that was put out and storyline and narrative. We know a lot more now about who was behind it. Um, we already know a great deal of material that has not been well reported, I think. Well, that's interesting, uh, low expectations. I think uh, there are more and more people who are, are, are figuring on that. You know, when I listen to Trey Gowdy speak, it's disturbing because he was almost apologetic on, us, on Face the Nation this Sunday. He talked about the emails we have from the ambassador that we didn't have, but he kept pointing out, look, Hillary Clinton is just one of 50 witnesses, and, you know, we're going to talk to her, but I'm more interested in this one, and I'm more interested in that one. I mean, look, she was Secretary of State. The request for security came to, to the, the, the State Department. He was turned down repeatedly. He was sent an email, uh, um, our ambassador was, uh, to look at from Assistant Secretary of State that came from Sidney Blumenthal on the security problem there. I mean, I, Hillary is the one you want to talk to, and I'm, I wish Trey Gowdy would stop doing damage control in advance of any damage. Well, here is my take as a journalist observer based on sources I've spoken to really from the start on all of this. Democrats have been very worried about this committee and Hillary Clinton from the start. She has done, my information says, internal polling that has given her reason to worry that the public doesn't think this is a Republican conspiracy. They think it's a legitimate question and that they agreed with the forming of the committee. It has turned up very important information, and as Democrats have gotten more and more panicked over it, they've well executed the strategy I believe they had planned over a year ago to controversialize the committee and Trey Gowdy and to get them exactly where they kind of seem to be today, in this defensive position where they're, instead of saying, yes, of course, we're investigating the Secretary of State, who was really the most relevant person that night in many ways, they're instead saying, no, 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 like you said, it's really not about her. So I think Democrats are worried, but I think they're well executing a propaganda or public relations strategy, and I'm not sure um, what the Republican strategy is at this point, except, you know, I... Trey Gowdy, I can only take him at what he says is he's out to get the facts and, you know, not to get Clinton specifically, but to, to get more information. And, of course, McCarthy and the other congressman and the staffer who was fired, you know, fed into the, the your, your scenario of a Democratic strategy. Uh, that was the, uh, the, the ingredients that they needed. Well, and the other thing that, again, just as an observer, I don't play politics, so that's up to them how they spin all this stuff, but... Of course, there are politics involved. I think it could be argued that the Obama administration was first to insert politics by forwarding a false narrative eight weeks ahead of President Obama's reelection campaign. I mean, it was very political. It doesn't mean there's anything 
legitimate or illegitimate about the investigation. It just means that, of course, politics is at the heart. These are political figures, and there's no way getting around that. Now, the bad thing would be if politics alone drives and motivates people to, to collect false information or to do something that, that's not legitimate. But if politics is simply a backdrop for the collection of facts and information, so be it. That's just the way the way things work. It doesn't mean that the investigation wouldn't be legitimate. Right. That's why I uh, I don't But instead, care like you say, everybody's running, oh, it's right. not politics, right. and you know, they're being put on the defensive. Yeah, I don't care about the, 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 the motivation, if the facts are the facts, and uh, the, the heck with the motivation. As a journalist, you who doesn't do politics, if you're on that committee, uh, maybe you ask, uh, again, Brett Baer's question, as you said. So what are the two questions that you would, if you had your, your 15 minutes or whatever, that you would ask the secretary? Steve, it's more of a line of questioning because she's gone over every possible question and answer. Remember, they've had three years in which they've revised their stories and compared notes. Right. So it's more a line of questioning where I would really try to find out the most about her actions that night. And I mean down to all the details, a TikTok minute by minute, which, by the way, should be recorded somewhere and accessible to freedom of information requests, but it's not. But I would get her TikTok where she was when, who she spoke to when, what they spoke about, what attempts she made to find out, you know, what rescue uh, availabilities or what military assets were available, why she did or didn't make inquiries, when she spoke to the president, what they talked about. And every time she gives one of those answers that I don't remember, which I don't think is credible when, you know, it's not credible she doesn't remember these key things. But if she doesn't, then I certainly think that draws into question a level of confident, competence if she can't remember key conversations with the President of the United States and what was discussed at certain times. And again, there should be notes of these things, and that should be accessible to freedom of information. Absolutely. But I would just get at the heart of all of these things and do my best to not let her not answer a question or to answer it in an ambiguous way. And I would also use her her um, hearing to get at the heart of what anything she knows about what went on at the White House, because that is still a mystery and may always remain a mystery as to what the president's actions were that night, right. where he was, and the decisions he made. Very quickly, what are you hearing about Biden? Is he getting in? Yes, Biden's getting in. Yeah, I know. This week, I guess, right? Any day? Well, I mean, that's just, you're, you're asking me yeah, as, yeah. As, a, as a source for you. Um, <laughs> you know, only Biden knows, but I've been told, I was told a month and a half ago from very, very, very good sources that he's getting in. Yeah, and how do you think that's going to affect Hillary? I think I, you know, again, I'm not a political analyst, but just anecdotally, I think he shoots to number one See, on the Democrat side. Interesting, interesting, because of her lack of trust and uh, believability? If she's not more popular now among the constituency she should have locked in, then I think that just signals some trouble for her, and I don't think things are necessarily going to get a lot better. I think there are more bumps on the road. So right. he, he may be perceived as having less baggage at this point, even though he's got the Obama Hill to climb. Cheryl, great to talk to you as always. Always appreciate it. And uh, we'll watch your show. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Cheryl Atkinson, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, uh, very, very uh, important uh, date coming up, of course, on Thursday, Hillary and Benghazi. We're coming back. Uh, we have the Molesburg panel with Nomiki Kunst and Ford O'Connell. Don't go away. <laughs>